In the previous video, the handling of digital multimeters was treated, so you should be familiar with measuring constant voltages. You can examine variable voltages by doing measurements at given times. Here, the charging procedure of a 1000 microfarad capacitor through a 12 kilo ohm resistor is recorded. This proceeding makes sense only if the voltage changes slowly over time. The smaller the capacitance of the RFC network, the faster the voltage across the capacitor is increasing and when using a 22 microfarad device, the curve can't be recorded with a multimeter. The instrument is too slow and reading a single value takes too much time. An electronic measuring device displaying a two-dimensional plot instead of single numerical values is called oscilloscope. As an advantage of this display mode, the progression of fastly changing voltages can be observed. The device I am using in this video is a DSO 2090 USB. DSO means Digital Storage Oscilloscope. The appendix USB indicates that the instrument is connected to a computer through an universal serial bus interface. The electric properties of an oscilloscope will be treated in the second half of the video. So let's start with the handling of that measuring instrument. The signal source used in this video is the line out connector of a tiny computer, by what sinusoidal signals ranging from some Hertz up to some kilohertz can be generated. A home built amplifier boosts the voltage to a maximum of 12V, which is non hazardous to human life. The signal to be measured is fed to one of the input connectors through a probe, and some later in this video I will talk about the electrical properties of this device. As soon as the tip of the probe touches the output pin of the tiny amplifier, a sine wave is displayed at the laptop screen. The operating system I'm using is Mint Linux running OpenHuntec to access the oscilloscope. Next I would like to explain how to read the values of the displayed signal. The coordinate system of the graph is represented by a dot line printed grid. The base unit of the grid is one division, which corresponds to the edge of a single rectangle. Each division is subdivided by 5 dots. Hence, one dot equals 0.2 divisions. The equivalence of one division can be read respectively adjusted using the drop down list to the right of the computer screen. The vertical axis representing the input voltage is adjusted to 1 volt per division, and the horizontal axis representing the time is adjusted to 2 milliseconds per division. The adjustment of the horizontal axis is also named time base or sweep. The peak to peak voltage can be read as 6.3 divisions, and 6.3 multiplied with 1 results in a voltage of 6.3V. The peak to peak voltage is also calculated by the software and we can read a value of 6.275V. The maximum absolute value of the sinusoidal signal is the peak voltage, also named semi-amplitude. At the horizontal axis we can read 1.9 divisions for a single oscillation of the signal, resulting in a period of 3.8 milliseconds, considering the time base of 2 milliseconds per division. The inverse value of the period is the frequency of the sine wave, which is 263Hz. Cursors are the second measurement method for the period of the signal. To do so, you must align the cursors with the exact waveform points intended. I am using two X intercepts of the signal, the software is calculating the period instantly. The frequency is also calculated automatically based on the cursor positions, once more we can read 263Hz. The accuracy of the DSO2090 is 3%, given as full scale specification, hence 
The true value of the period is somewhere between 3.2 and 4.4 milliseconds at a reading of 3.8 milliseconds. Thus, the true frequency is between 227 and 313 Hz. The vertical accuracy is also 3% of full scale, thus, when set to 1V per division, the full scale value is 8V, the resulting measurement error 0.24V and the true value somewhere between 6.1 and 6.5V at a reading of 6.3V. The scale reading precision, meaning the minimal difference between two points of a signal, is approximately 0.05 divisions. The voltage reading precision is 0.05 times 1 volt and the time reading precision 0.05 times 2 milliseconds. Hence, we get 0.05 volts for the vertical axis and 0.1 milliseconds for the horizontal axis. The reading precision of the horizontal axis can be improved by adjusting a lower value for the time base. At 400 microseconds per division, we get a reading of 9.65 divisions according to a period of 3.86 milliseconds. Now, the given accuracy is still 3%, but the full scale value is 4 milliseconds by what the resulting error is just 0.12 milliseconds while the scale reading precision increased to 0.02 milliseconds. Like with digital multimeters, you should always dial the smallest range possible to read a value at the display of an oscilloscope. Measuring the peak to peak voltage with the vertical axis set to 5V per division results in a minimum scale reading of 0.25V and a measurement error of 1.2V. We get a reading of 1.3 divisions, which is 6.5V and the true value is somewhere between 5.3 and 7.7V. When adjusting a vertical scale of 500mV per division, the peaks of the sine curve are out of range. The oscilloscope records the input signal periodically, so we can see a varying amplitude as soon as I am turning the potentiometer of the amplifier. But when does a single measurement start? Well, a triggered sweep starts at a selected point on the signal, providing a stable display. Certain conditions of the input signal can be adjusted to set the starting point. Currently, the sine curve starts to the left of the screen with increasing slope at the middle axis and it ends to the right of the screen after 4 milliseconds. The middle axis corresponds to 0 volts. A new measurement starts as soon as the signal climbs above 0 volts after falling below that threshold. Almost one oscillation is skipped, because at the end of the last measurement, the signal was above the 0 volts level with increasing slope. The trigger gets unlocked if the signal falls below 0 volts and finally the measurement starts as soon as the input voltage exceeds that threshold again. Of course, the trigger level can be different from 0 volts. With the software used here, a small triangle at the right edge of the display has to be moved to the desired level. When adjusting a higher trigger level, the measurement of the displayed sine curve starts not until this voltage level is reached. Now, the signal starts no longer at the middle axis, but at a higher level, conforming to the adjusted trigger voltage. The displayed sine curve moves to the left. When adjusting a negative trigger level, the curve moves to the right. If the trigger mode is set to normal, no new measurement starts when adjusting a trigger level that the input signal doesn't exceed. 
When lowering the voltage output of the amplifier by turning the potentiometer, we can't see any changes of the signal at the screen. Not until the trigger level is adjusted to a value lower than the peak voltage of the input signal, the oscilloscope starts new measurements and we can see that the amplitude was decreasing meanwhile. As long as the signal being measured exceeds the trigger level, the auto mode is identically to the normal mode, but if the input voltage stays below the adjusted threshold, the oscilloscope restarts the measurement after each sweep. As a result of this mode, the sine curve starts moving around its horizontal position whenever the input signal doesn't exceed the trigger level. Another signal characteristic to be adjusted for triggering is the slope of the signal. When set to decreasing slope, the measurement starts if the input voltage falls below the trigger threshold after rising above that voltage, once again the trigger level is adjusted to 0 volts. Now, the sine curve starts at the left edge of the screen with negative going voltage, independently from the trigger level. When readjusting to increasing slope, the curve starts with positive going voltage again. A storage oscilloscope provides another trigger functionality. The device can display a region of the signal before the trigger event occurred. To do so, the tiny triangle at the upper edge of the screen has to be moved to the designated position. Now, the measurement is still triggered when exceeding the 0V threshold with positive going voltage, but the oscilloscope displays the signal even 1.6ms in front of that event. That's illustrated with a time base of 200 microseconds per division. By now, there is no entire period of the sine curve displayed, but we can observe the progression across 800 microseconds before the measurement was triggered. When moving the cursor to the right, we can observe a larger area of the curve to the left of the trigger point. With the help of the trigger level, the slope and the timing, we can observe different areas of the signal. With a microphone, the bouncing of marbles on a wooden plate will be recorded next, firstly with the trigger mode set to auto. As you can see, the oscilloscope restarts the measurement perpetually, hence the peaks disappear as soon as the marbles come to rest. If the normal mode is selected, each bounce of each marble is recorded. In single mode, only one event is triggered, thus just the first bounce of the first marble is recorded. The oscilloscope is paused after the trigger event occurred until the measuring instrument is reactivated manually. The point of zero volts on the vertical axis can also be adjusted. Up to now, the middle axis of the screen represented that voltage. By sliding the CH1 symbol vertically, the point of zero volts can be set to the desired level. The vertical position of the sine curve is moving accordingly. Let's place the zero volts level at the bottom of the display and adjust the vertical axis to 500 millivolts per division, by what we can observe the positive half of the sine curve more precisely. We get 6.2 divisions for the positive peak... ...and after moving the zero volts level to the top of the display, we get the same reading for the negative peak. Consequently, the scale reading of the peak-to-peak -peak voltage is enhanced by this proceeding. The peak-to-peak -peak voltage is calculated by the software and we get a reading of 3.175V for the negative half of the sine wave. Voltage is a difference in potential between two points in a system, with the reference potential connected to the clamp of the probe. Until now, the clamp was connected with the ground terminal of the tiny computer operating as signal source. 
As soon as the clamp is connected to the negative terminal of the battery serving as power supply of the amplifier, the sine curve moves vertically. After readjusting the oscilloscope, we can see that the signal at the output of the amplifier stays above 2.8V, while the curve progression is still sinusoidal. Academically speaking, the signal is a superposition of an alternating voltage with a peak to peak value of 6.4V and a constant voltage of 6.0V. The steady component can be removed from the input signal. To do so, the channel of the oscilloscope has to be set to AC functionality. Now only the alternating fraction of the signal is displayed. After adapting the 0V level and the trigger threshold, the vertical setting can be readjusted to 1V per division. The displayed curve is identically to the initial signal with the clamp of the probe connected to the ground terminal of the computer, the voltage offset caused by the battery is removed from the input signal. The oscilloscope has two input channels, hence two input signals can be recorded simultaneously. We can see two sinusoidal signals with the period of the green curve being twice as much as that of the yellow curve. Each of the input signals can be allocated to one of the axes. The X axis represents no longer the time, but the input voltage of channel 1, while channel 2 is represented by the Y axis. This is called the XY mode of the oscilloscope. The resulting graph of the two sine curves is a horizontally 8. If the frequency of both signals is identically and if there is no phase shift, the resulting graph is a simple line with an angle of 45 degrees. More complex figures are the result of a frequency ratio of 2 to 3, 1 to 3, 1 to 4 and so on. Those graphs are called lesser U curves. Besides the frequency ratio, the resulting graphs are affected by the phase angle. Now, the frequency ratio is very close to 1 to 2, thus the phase angle will rise slowly. That's reflected by the varying lesser U figure. That's all about the handling of an oscilloscope, now I would like to talk about the electric properties of a digital storage oscilloscope. There are three B and C connectors at the front side. The left and the middle one are internally joined with the two input channels and the right one can be used to feed the oscilloscope with external trigger signals. At the center of the back side you can see the USB connector and at the left there is a pin internally connected to ground. The right pin is internally connected to a 1kHz square wave signal with a peak to peak voltage of 2V. As we will see some later, this signal can be used for setting up the compensation of test probes. Firstly I will connect channel 1 to the test signal using the probe. The black clamp is connected to the ground pin, while the tip of the probe is joined with the pin of the test signal. As expected, we can see a 1kHz square wave signal at the screen. But how perfectly does the displayed signal hit the set point? The frequency of the input signal calculated by the software is indeed around 1kHz. The accuracy of the DSO2090 is given as 3% from full scale, hence for the adjusted time base of 200 microseconds per divisions, we get 2000 microseconds for the full scale reading and so an error of plus minus 60 microseconds. Consequently, the reading of the period should be somewhere between 1060 and 940 microseconds, resulting in a frequency between 943 and 1064 Hz. 
the frequency calculated by the software hits the requirements. Same is for the peak to peak voltage, for which we get an error of 0.12V at a vertical adjustment of 500mV per division, and so the reading should be somewhere between 2.12 and 1.88V. If the reading is outside the specifications, the oscilloscope can be calibrated using internal potentiometers. Potentiometer number 1 and 2 vary the display potential of the two input channels, and number 3 sets the peak to peak voltage of the test signal. Striking are the rounded corners at the upper end of the rising edge, respectively at the lower end of the falling edge. Let's enlarge the rising edge of the signal by setting a smaller time base and readjusting the trigger time. These operations from an ideal square shape are caused by the capacitance of the circuit, which slows down the edge transitions of a signal. The coaxial cable of the probe is equivalent to a stretched capacitor, and according to the datasheet, the capacitance of the whole unit is 47 picofarad. Additionally, the capacitance of the electronic circuits of the oscilloscope have to be considered, which is listed in the manual as 50 picofarad. By attaching the second probe to the pin of the test signal, a second capacitor is connected in parallel to the first input channel. As expected, the aberration is increasing. The effect becomes obviously when switching a 100nF capacitor in parallel to the pins of the test signal. The distortion is increasing with increasing resistance of the network under test, thus the capacitance of the measurement equipment should be as low as possible. As demonstrated in my video about digital multimeters, the input resistance of a voltmeter has to be considered. I'm now connecting a chain composed of three 220 kilo ohm resistors to the square wave signal. The output impedance of the oscilloscope's test signal is sufficiently low, thus the peak to peak voltage is kept constant when connecting the load. Now I am connecting channel 1 in parallel to the first resistor of the chain. The detected voltage should be one third of the input voltage, thus we should read 0.66V. Actually we can determine 5.65 divisions, which correlates to a peak to peak voltage of just 0.565V. Considering the accuracy of 3% from full scale, we get an error of 24mV at a vertical setting of 100mV per division, hence the reading should be somewhere between 0.643 and 0.691V. Even when including the manufacturing tolerance of the resistors, which is 5%, the reading should be somewhere between 0.62 and 0.71V. The discrepancy is caused by the input resistance of the oscilloscope, which is 1 megaohm. By attaching the probe to the circuit under test, the resistance ratio inside of the chain shifts, hence the voltage drop across the first resistor decreases to just 0.581V. Considering the accuracy, the reading should be somewhere between 0.557 and 0.605V, which is true for the measured voltage of 0.565V. As soon as I am connecting both channels in parallel to the first resistor, the peak to peak voltage is decreasing some more, since there are two 1 mega ohm resistors connected in parallel to the resistor under test by now. Next I am connecting the probe of channel number 2 in parallel to the middle resistor of the circuit under test. Now, the reading of channel number 1 is 0 volts. That's because of the fact that the two input channels of the oscilloscope are not isolated from each other, the ground clamps of both probes are joined internally. 
by connecting the ground clamp of the second probe to the point between the right and the middle resistor, the right resistor and so the probe of channel number 1 gets bypassed. Both clamps of the probes have to be connected to the ground terminal or else the oscilloscope or a device of the circuit under test might get damaged. With the open Huntex software, the signal across the middle resistor can be calculated. To do so, the ground clamp of the second probe has to be reconnected to the ground pin of the circuit under test. By now, channel number 1 displays the signal across the right resistor, while channel number 2 displays that across the right and the middle resistor. The difference in potential across the middle resistor, hence the voltage input of channel number 2 minus that of channel number 1 is displayed as light blue line. Now I am joining the ground clamp of channel number 1 with the tip of the probe. Let's have a closer look at the displayed line by lowering the time base and dialing the lowest vertical adjustment possible, which is 10 mV per division. The displayed signal of channel number 1 is not a flat line, but a thin band. One reason for the divergence between ideal and real measurement is electromagnetic radiation emitted by all electronic circuits. In fact, the conductive path running from the probe to the oscilloscope is shielded from electromagnetic radiation by a coaxial cable, but the ground clamp connected to the tip of the probe is forming an unshielded conductive loop. Whenever that loop is exposed to a varying magnetic field, a voltage is generated. The band is widened if I am getting close to a computer power supply with the shortened probe. The laptop used as oscilloscope screen also emits electromagnetic radiation. The oscilloscope is fed with electric power through the USB interface of the laptop, which isn't an ideal DC voltage source. Channel number 1 is connected to the power pin of an USB connector and when masking the DC fraction of the input signal and setting the vertical axis to 10mV per division, we can see the unwanted AC fraction of the input voltage. The more the input voltage is smoothened, the better the output signal. The random fluctuation in the displayed input signal is called noise and since that's a characteristic of all electronic circuits, including the circuits of the oscilloscope itself, it can't be wiped out completely. Another reason why a line is not displayed as an ideal line is the resolution of the used analog to digital converter. The DSO2090 has an 8-bit converter. 8-bit means that the device can convert the analog input voltage into 256 different digital values. I have zoomed in to a linear area of the sine curve by setting up the trigger and the time base. When using a thin line for displaying the signal and having a close look at the zoomed area, you will recognize the limitations of the 8-bit resolution. At a vertical setting of 1V per division, the full scale reading is 8V, which correlates to 255, the maximum number of the analog to digital converter. The input signal is quantized by the converter and the minimum change in voltage is equivalent to 8 divided by 256, which is 31mV. An analog to digital converter with a higher resolution is needed to reduce the distortions caused by the digitalization of the input signal. A 10-bit converter can encode an analog input to 1 in 1024 different levels, thus we get a minimum change in voltage of just 8mV. Another limitation of an oscilloscope is the number of measurements per second or, vice versa, the amount of time needed to record a single value. 
Let's have a look at the square wave signal with a pulse length of approximately 260 nanoseconds generated by a microcontroller. As you can see, there is no steady display of the square wave signal. An advantage of a storage oscilloscope is the pause functionality, freezing the signal on the display. At a time base of 40 nanoseconds per division, the signal is displayed with noticeable spikes. That's because the setting of the horizontal axis is at the physical limit of the oscilloscope. The analog to digital converter needs 10 nanoseconds for a single conversion. So there is one measurement each 10 nanoseconds, which correlates to more than 0.2 divisions at the current setting of the horizontal axis. When dialing a time base of 10 nanoseconds, there is just one point of measurement in one division, and the plot is more a zigzag pattern than a curve. The software adjustment is clearly below the physical limit of the DSO2090, hence, a time base below 100 nanoseconds is not useful for measurements with that oscilloscope. Vice versa, 10 nanoseconds for a single conversion means that 100 million measurements can be done in one second. The resulting sampling rate is 100 mega samples per second. The sinusoidal signal with a frequency of 8 MHz generated by the crystal oscillator of the microcontroller is captured with only 12 values per oscillation, hence it is clearly distorted. In order to do suitable measurements of the curve progression, a higher sampling rate is needed. You can barely identify the signal as a sinusoidal oscillation. The higher the sample rate, the more data is accumulated each second. With a sample rate of 100 mega samples per second and an 8 bit analog to digital converter, we get 1 byte per sample and so 100 megabytes per second, or even 200 megabytes per second in 2 channel mode. Since the oscilloscope is connected to the laptop through an USB 2.0 interface, the transfer rate is limited to 24 megabytes per second, thus, some of the data must be skipped. To avoid gaps at the displayed curve caused by skipped samples, the DSO2090 has an internal memory capable of buffering up to 64,000 samples. In 2 channel mode, only half the memory is available per channel, thus, 32,000 samples can be recorded in one pass using the full sample rate of 100 mega samples per second. The oscilloscope is now recording two square wave signals with slightly differing base frequency to illustrate that some of the recorded samples are dropped. Firstly, the base frequency is low, we get 30.5 respectively 30.6 Hz, which is why the yellow curve is sliding slowly from the right to the left of the screen, with just some small breaks in movement. The sample rate calculated by the oscilloscope is 250 kilo samples per second. If the base frequency is set to 1400, respectively 1405 Hz, the yellow curve is moving fastly and as noticeable in slow motion with large gaps between two displayed frames. The sample rate is 10 mega samples per second, thus there are 20 megabytes accumulated each second. Besides the transfer rate of the USB port, the refresh rate of the screen limits the number of displayed samples per second. A refresh rate of 1000 frames per second would be needed to display all of the sampled data and no human eye would be fast enough to notice all of them. Thus, skipping samples is a minor issue when recording signals with an oscilloscope. Let's have a closer look at the minimal and maximal input voltage. Once again, the clamp and the tip of the probe are joined and the vertical axis is set to the highest sensitivity, which is 10 mV per division. 
The minimal difference in potential detectable by the DSO2090 is not listed in the datasheet, but when having a close look at the display, it must be around 0.05 divisions. Hence, we get a maximum resolution of approximately 0.5mV. The root mean square voltage of the input signal should not exceed 35V. Partial probes can be used to examine even higher voltages. The probe is now connected to an adjustable transformer of a model railway. As soon as the tiny switch is set to position 10, just one tenth of the voltage applied to the tip of the probe is forwarded to the input channel of the oscilloscope. In order to get the voltage at the circuit under test, the signal reading has to be multiplied by 10. Hence, the maximum voltage that can be examined by this measurement arrangement is 350V. But heads up, high voltages are dangerous to human life and if you forget to set the probe to position 10 before starting the measurement, you will destroy the oscilloscope. Note that the electric properties of the probe will change when setting the switch to position 10. The input resistance increases from 1 to 10 mega ohm and the capacitance decreases from 47 to 15.5 picofarad. An adjustable capacitor allows to compensate distortions caused by the voltage divider of the probe when set to position 10. Turn the capacitor in such a way that the square wave signal is displayed correctly. You remember the voltage divider composed of three 220 kilo ohm resistors? With the partial probe switched to position 10, the input resistance of the measuring unit is clearly higher than before and so the detected voltage across resistor 1 is increasing. As a disadvantage, the noise is also amplified by the oscilloscope, but the reading is definitely closer to the anticipated value. We can read 66mV, which correlates to a voltage of 0.66V at the tip of the partial probe. The reading hits the value predicted by Ohm's law. Channel 1 is connected to the output pin of an R-stable multivibrator with a 1 mega ohm resistor capacitor circuit. When trying to examine the signal across the capacitor simultaneously by attaching the second probe to the inverting input of the operational amplifier, the LED stops flashing. When switching the second probe to 10, the input resistance of our measurement arrangement is increasing to 10 mega ohm, thus we can determine the voltage across the capacitor using this trick. As explained before, the ground clamps of the probes are joined, hence you should think twice before attaching one of them to the circuit under test. Through the USB connector and the power supply of the laptop, the ground terminal of the oscilloscope is joined with the ground terminal of the computer power supply shown here. When connecting one of the clamps to a point different from ground at the circuit under test, you will short the circuit, which might damage a device or the oscilloscope. To avoid shortening the circuit under test with the ground clamps of the oscilloscope, a power supply with complete electrical isolation, like a battery, is needed. Now you can connect the clamp of the probe to any point of the circuit. But heads up, the second clamp of the second probe must be connected to the same point of the circuit under test, or else you will discover another way of shortening a circuit. When examining the signals on a board or the breadboard shown here, you should connect the ground clamp to the negative terminal of the power supply. Now you can start scanning the signals at the board. Have care not to slip from the pins with the probe or else you might shorten the circuit under test. 
same as for multimeters, there is. Keep away from high voltages if you are not trained in handling an oscilloscope. The line out connector of a computer as used in this video is a short circuit proof signal source with low peak voltage. It can be used even without an amplifier by simply plugging in an audio cable with two 3.5mm phone connectors. The ground clamp of the oscilloscope has to be attached to the ring at the shaft of the phone connector, while the probes are joined with the middle ring respectively the tip. With a sound editor like Audacity, you can generate signals with various shape, frequency or amplitude. Have fun! Besides the chapter about oscilloscopes, you can find some more information about measurements and technical stuff on the project page. Thanks for watching and I'll be back!